please let this be a normal field trip? That's a rather aspirational hope, Arnold. Uh, shouldn't you be praying that you'll get to at least survive another wild trip with the Frizz? Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and celestial bodies, I am Sir Goodness. Since I haven't seen any other lawyer do it, what would be the legal consequences if, for just a moment, reality ensued during a wacky adventure on the Magic School Bus, specifically, the one where Arnold dies? This reaction video of it is pristine. Anyway, in the very first episode of the Magic School Bus, Miss Frizz decides to take the kids on a tour of our solar system, praising the sun and exploring the planets with intrepid drive. Their final stop is Pluto, which Miss Frizzle righteously recognizes as a planet, unlike the likes of today's scientific community and Gustav Holst, who was doing it before it was cool. You might be saying, well, Pluto wasn't discovered or named yet, but he still refused, for reasons notwithstanding Pluto being a planet. Skipping on, the magic school bus arrives on Pluto. Arnold's cousin Janet is trying to hoard an assortment of space rocks and other cosmic paraphernalia. She plans to take it all back home to Earth, where probably, somewhat likely, not too much of a stretch, and all the not implausibly, will sell the moon rocks and other stuff to a certain megalomaniacal shower curtain salesman. For those of you thinking three or four parallel universes ahead, I don't think Janet would be liable for her buyer's health consequences of standing around the moon rocks for too long. Thanks to a lapse in Janet's judgment, the magic school bus can no longer hold her contraband. She sits on her pile of potential riches and vehemently refuses to leave the planet. Although the magic school bus can effortlessly perform interstellar travel within what I assume to be a single school day, no one thinks of flying back to Earth with some of the cargo and then returning to collect the remaining goods. Instead, Arnold escalates the situation faster than the Cuban Missile Crisis and tries to warn of the dire consequences of lingering around on a planet with no atmosphere and meager supplies. He opts for a demonstrative approach and takes off his helmet, which naturally turns him into a human popsicle. Carlos. Fortunately for Arnold, this is a kid's show. So, in the next scene, we see that he has made a miraculous recovery with only a minor cold. But let's bring reality into the mix for this part of the show, and pretend that Arnold ends up perishing from exposure to the extremely cold and non-breathable atmosphere of Pluto. I don't think instantly turning into an ice sculpture is entirely realistic, but I'm not particularly knowledgeable about scientific law. In the Arnold Dies video, the person reacting inquires how could Miss Frizzle afford future field trips after the lawsuit. So. Let's talk about that lawsuit. The lawsuit would be a wrongful death case with Arnold's parents, or Arnold's estate, as the plaintiff. The defendants would be Miss Frizzle and the school district that she teaches in. First, the plaintiffs would argue that flying around space and lollygagging on other plants for a field trip is an inherently dangerous activity. If this argument were to fail, then the plaintiffs would argue that the defendants have a duty to ensure student safety by preparing them for space, and that the defendant's negligence caused Arnold's untimely transformation into an ice pop, which also happened to end his life. Carlos. As I delve into the law that would apply to this hypothetical case, when I'm not referring to general concepts, I'll refer to Florida law. Besides, this whole thing sounds like a Florida man's story. So first, what's this fancy term, inherently dangerous activities? Unfortunately, there's no holy scripture, sacred texts, or comprehensive lists of activities that are considered inherently dangerous. Juries and judges, when there's no jury, will decide if an activity is inherently dangerous. In various jurisdictions, the term abnormally dangerous activity is used for the same concept. In Florida, inherently dangerous activities are those that will probably cause injury if proper precautions aren't taken. So, an inherently dangerous activity is the kind of activity that if you don't take reasonable precautions, the activity will make your body collapse like a Jenga tower, or make the world around you collapse like a Jenga tower. Taking the students on a field trip to outer space and the planets is probably an inherently dangerous activity. 
especially when considering that failing to take proper precautions in space, like wearing functional spacesuits, is a prime recipe for filling in a cemetery burial plot. Perhaps the defendants could make an argument, at least while we continue to follow the cartoon logic of the show, that the magic school bus and the spacesuits were remarkably safe, which would make the activity not so dangerous. However, this argument will probably falter because humans can't survive direct exposure to the void of space or non-breathable atmospheres, regardless of the quality of spacecraft and spacesuits. If the judge or jury finds that a space-borne field trip is inherently dangerous, then the plaintiffs only need to prove that Miss Frizz took Arnold and the class to Pluto, and that Arnold died like it's a Crash Bandicoot level. This is because inherently dangerous activities impose strict liability. I'll explain strict liability real quick. First, there are strict liability crimes, which are crimes that don't require intent. The state just needs to prove that you committed the crime. An example is speeding tickets. It doesn't matter whether you intended to speed or not, it's only relevant that you are driving over the speed limit. Strict liability for torts are when you don't need to prove negligence. You only need to prove that something bad happened, someone got hurt, and that the defendant was responsible for it. By the way, torts have nothing to do with warts or pop-tarts. Unless you get warts from pop-tarts because that's not supposed to happen. Torts are civil wrongs that create legal liability. They aren't crimes, but they're still wrong, and you can sue over them. If Miss Frizz's wild interplanetary adventure is somehow not found to be an inherently dangerous activity, then the plaintiffs would have to prove negligence. Negligence has four elements, duty, breach, causation, and damages. Let's start by looking at a defense that could potentially be raised, the fact that Arnold took off his own helmet. He must be a victim of his own negligence, the silly boy. The problem with this defense is that defendants would have to successfully argue that Arnold, a child, knew that taking off his helmet would be lethal. Looking at the context, Arnold was trying to convince Janet to leave Pluto by giving up on her hoardings. My guess is that Arnold thought that he would be starved for air, temporarily asphyxiate, and then immediately put his helmet back on after demonstrating his point. In this case, he had no idea he would look like a Mr. Freeze victim Carlos. because a certain someone did not inform him and the other students that such a spectacle would happen. Following this logic, the potential negligence would not be about preventing Arnold from taking off his helmet. It would be about failing to inform Arnold that taking off his helmet would insta-kill him. Continuing to the elements of negligence, the plaintiff would first show that the defendants owed a duty of care to the safety of Arnold and the other students while on the field trip. They breached that duty by failing to properly educate and train the students on safety in space. I mean Miss Frizz! The kids are on Venus, the second planet of the day, and only then do you tell them that they must keep their spacesuits on to stay safe? Anyway, this breach foreseeably caused Arnold, who is a child, to not understand the icy consequences of taking off his helmet, so he took it off and perished. And that's the negligence case. Summing it up, the plaintiffs have two virtually ironclad arguments to work with. First is that going to space is an inherently dangerous activity because you can't survive exposure to the void of space or a non-breathable atmosphere. If for some reason this is not an inherently dangerous activity, the alternative is the negligent failure to prepare the kids for a field trip in space. With all that laid out, I think Arnold's parents, as the plaintiffs, are practically guaranteed to win this wrongful death case. It will probably not even go to trial, and most likely be settled out of court. I think it's pretty clear that Miss Frizzle is, from a legal perspective, toast. But what about the school district? I think they are too, under something called vicarious liability. Vicarious liability can also be known as respondeat superior, which pronunciation I probably murdered harder than a Roman legion going up against one of Hannibal's elephant armies. But which, by the way, the term originated in ancient Rome to designate that a master is responsible for his slave or servant's action when they are acting within the scope of the master's assignments. In modern law, vicarious liability and respondeat superior, I don't care, generally hold that employers are liable for their employer's actions within the employer's scope of work. 
Various states and courts will sometimes play that ball and cup game with the terms, but respondeat superior is usually referred to as the overarching doctrine, with vicarious liability as the working term. Anyway, now that we've got that ironed out, the big question here is if Miss Frizzle taking a class on a field trip through space is within the scope of her employment with the school. Clearly, teaching a class, including taking them on a field trip, is within the scope of her employment as a teacher. The only thing that could possibly be outside of the scope of employment is the whole going to space part. However, Miss Frizzle is doing it in the name of teaching her students about the solar system and the planets. So, while a field trip in space is a wild concept, I think that it's still within the scope of her employment, which means that the school is vicariously liable for her actions. An example is how employers are liable for delivery drivers' accidents while those drivers are making deliveries. Let's take the Spider-Man 2 pizza delivery scene. Joe's Pizza will be liable for any damages Peter inflicts on others while trying to deliver the pizza on time, since Peter is acting within the scope of his employment as a pizza time delivery boy. If Parker decides to go fast and furious on the moped and ends up breaking someone's leg along the way, Joe's will be vicariously liable. On the same token, if Peter decides to deliver the pizza as Spidey, as he does in the movie, Joe's will still be vicariously liable for damages resulting from Spider-Man's negligent behavior, such as accidental property damage. This is, of course, assuming that there is sufficient evidence to prove that Peter Parker is the Spider-Man. Now that the lawsuit is explained, and it seems clear that the defendants, Miss Frizz and the school district, will lose this case, let's look at the damages real quick and see if Miss Frizzle could afford to go on field trips after the lawsuit. This will depend on the jurisdiction the lawsuit takes place in. The majority of states would find the defendants jointly and severally liable, meaning that Miss Frizzle and the school district would both be independently liable for all of the damages. So the plaintiffs can collect some or all of the money owed from either defendant. A minority of states have abolished joint and several liability, in part or completely. Most of them use the comparative negligence standard instead, where the judge or jury decides what percentage of damages each defendant should pay. Comparative negligence would be more favorable for the school district, as they will likely owe the plaintiffs less money than it would in a joint and several liability jurisdiction. There is no way to place an exact or even rough dollar amount on this hypothetical lawsuit, but it could be up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. If Miss Frizzle doesn't have a homeowner's insurance policy that does not exclude wrongful death in this context, she will probably become broke. If she's a completely abject, without a penny or assets to her name, she may be judgment-proof, which is a term for defendants who can't afford to pay the damages entered against them. In a joint and several liability jurisdiction, the school district will be on the hook for anything that Miss Frizzle doesn't pay. In a comparative negligence jurisdiction, the plaintiffs will lose out on the percentage that Miss Frizzle owes them. As for Miss Frizzle, I feel like that out of fear of her losing her precious magic school bus, she would flee the state or even the country. Perhaps she would assume the new identity of Senora Rizas and become Dora the Explorer's bus driver. So, in conclusion, Miss Frizzle won't be able to afford more field trips after the lawsuit regarding Arnold's metamorphosis into the likely result of Queen Elsa's ice bending powers. This lawsuit will succeed either because going to space is inherently dangerous, or because Miss Frizzle failed to reasonably prepare her class for a field trip in space. Thank you for watching this video about the hypothetical Magic School Bus lawsuit. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you want to see videos directly or tangentially similar to this one. Bye!